Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to look at the influence of population density on how land is used in cities. And we'll start with a little bit of a review of the bid rent theory. Land use in cities is a product of how accessible it is. More accessible land is more useful to more people. Therefore, that land will be more valuable. That should be review for us. But now we're going to apply that concept to the idea of population density. If the land is more valuable or expensive, that land will be used more intensively. So specific houses will be constructed to increase population density. As distance from the CBD increases, the land becomes less accessible, thus less valuable, and housing units and population density will become less dense. So let's use Burgess's concentric zone model to illustrate this point. When we first talked about this, I had you focus on the rings, but this time I want you to focus on the building types and density. Notice the CBD. This land is most accessible, therefore most valuable, therefore will be used most intensively so developers will build very tall buildings, skyscrapers, to maximize the use of that land. The zone of transition was where factories were, but it's also where our poorest residents live. But wait, if the land is expensive, how can the poorest people live there? In the zone of transition, we're going to see multi-story apartment buildings that allow many families to live on a single parcel of land. This spreads out the more expensive cost of the land across many families, thereby lowering the cost per family, but increasing the population density. Then as we continue to move farther from the CBD, land is cheaper because it's less accessible allowing wealthier individuals to buy up bigger plots of land and to big, build big homes in the suburbs, resulting in significantly lower population densities. Now let's move away from theories and models and provide some real life examples. New York City is easily the most densely populated city in the United States, with an average of 27,000 people per square mile. By comparison, Los Angeles has an average density of about 7,500 people per square mile. And Las Vegas has an average of over 5,000 people per square mile. But as you can see, as distance from the CBD of Las Vegas increases, population density decreases to Henderson and then further out to Boulder City, thus supporting our theories. But how does that compare with cities around the world? Tokyo has an average density of more than 37,000 people per square mile. Seoul in South Korea averages about 42,000 people per square mile. Paris in France is more than twice as dense as New York with 56,000 people per square mile. And those are just core countries. In the mega and meta cities of the periphery, several that are primate cities, population density can be significantly higher. In Lagos in Nigeria, Mumbai in India, and Dhaka in Bangladesh have remarkably high population densities. But the difference in urban population density can be explained by differences in housing types. Newly built homes in the United States average over 2,000 square feet, while new homes average about 1,000 square feet in Japan and just over 600 square feet in China, according to a 2015 study. A population density gradient that you see in the bottom left can show us how different housing types can yield different population densities in an urban area. Relatively few people live in the CBD, 
where land costs are so high that they're outbid by commercial activities. But those that do live in the CBD may live in apartments at the top of skyscrapers. Then, as you get further from the CBD, we see multi-story apartment buildings with very high population densities. Then single family structures that are spaced close together. These go by different names regionally, but row houses are a common name for these buildings that feature single family units that are attached to one another in a row. As you get onto less accessible and thus less valuable land, housing types become more spaced out, leading to lower population densities. Duplexes that you see here feature just two families, each in their own single family units that share a wall down the middle. Then finally, the single family detached homes of the suburbs, which are the lowest density because the land is relatively cheap compared to other parts of the urban area. So wealthier families will live far removed from the city center, at least in the United States, and commute to work using their personal cars. They can buy larger parcels of land with homes that have more square footage and big backyards. If we were to go back to our quantitative population density statistics and compare housing types, New York City has many mid-rise buildings, but then single-family homes and duplexes farther from the downtown area. But Paris is almost exclusively composed of apartment buildings, producing the significantly higher population density. And then Henderson, Nevada looks like this. So the residential buildings and patterns of land use reflect and shape how cities function and their histories. We already know that changes in developments in transportation systems made it possible for people to live farther from the city center. By the turn of the 20th century, streetcars and trains, and then after World War II, personal automobiles, made it possible for more people to buy low-density, single-family homes on cheap land which in turn expanded the sizes of cities, especially in North America, such that it makes it very difficult to live without a car, completing this feedback loop. And further advances in communication technology have made it easier to remain connected to the city without being physically present in it. But let's compare this again to European cities. Cities like Paris were built before the invention of automobiles, so work, home, and services had to be within walking distance of one another. Combine this with history, culture, and government policies like higher gasoline taxes, cities in Europe have remained densely populated. But transportation systems contributed to changing sociocultural patterns as well. As early as the 19th century, social classes in the United States began spatially separating. The wealthiest families could afford to move farther away from the commercial and industrial areas, leaving lower income groups closer to the city center. This was also marked by racial, ethnic, and linguistic differences as well. After 1970, U.S. cities saw a decline in their white population as they moved to the suburbs in a pattern that has been labeled white flight. Working class and low income families would then move into urban homes and neighborhoods that had been vacated by the more affluent, a process known as succession. The worst housing was then abandoned, leading to urban blight, which served as an additional push factor for families who could afford to leave. And as more people, especially middle and upper income families, moved to the suburbs, we began to see the disaggregation of commercial activities from the CBD. 
The traditional CBD began to decline in influence as cities became polycentric. We began to see edge cities, as we see here with the galactic city model, focused on technology and information services or office parks that had risen to influence in the suburbs. This further spurred investment in building more low density residential housing, like what we saw here in Henderson during the early 2000s until the Great Recession of 2007. But in some cities, formerly abandoned properties in the city center are being redeveloped in a process known as infill development. This is the building of new retail, business, or residential spaces on vacant or underused parcels in previously built areas. So the old factory may become new high-density apartments, or an abandoned warehouse could be repurposed into a popular new restaurant, or a vacant lot may be turned into a community garden or park. And by building higher density housing on each parcel, it makes it more likely that people will be able to find a home at an affordable price. For example, demand for housing in Seattle and San Francisco is very high. Seattle changed some of its laws to allow for more infill development to increase the height and density of housing. San Francisco, on the other hand, is only utilizing about half of its infill housing potential. But we will continue to examine the impacts of residential housing options on population density when we return to class. Have a good evening, everyone.